Hi, thanks for joining us today. I'm Sarah Saunders, the Head of Learning and National Partnerships at the British Museum, and I'm joined today by my colleagues Hilary Williams and Maria Boynowska, who I will introduce later on. It's wonderful to be here today as part of the Association of Art Histories Festival 2022, a nationwide celebration of art history and visual cultures. This talk is going to introduce you into how you can use the British Museum as a resource for teaching and learning about art history. And it's really perfect timing to speak to you for those of you who are students and lecturers, teachers at the start of a new academic year and to give you an update on what we've been working on recently and our plans um, over the coming years. It's a really exciting time for the British Museum at present as we uh, come out of the pandemic we're building back our audiences and visitors and we're thinking and consulting with people about how we are going to reimagine the British Museum for the future to become ever more inclusive and representative of the history of the world and that includes art history as well and our interconnectedness from multiple viewpoints. So when I was thinking about this talk, it's, it's important to think about what we're going to be talking about here. What we're talking about is both art history as an academic discipline and also the global story of the history of art, the interconnectedness of human creativity over 30,000 years or more. And I say more because archaeologists, scientists are always discovering new things about those earliest examples of human visual culture and representation. And new scientific research and new technologies are really helping us to do that. So it's a really exciting time as well for that. So uh, today I'm going to talk about some of the ways um, you can use the museum and its collections as a resource for art history, whether you're a lecturer, a student, an enthusiast, or whether you can visit the collection in London. And then my colleagues will also talk about, um, if you're not in London, how you can access the collections outside of, of London and elsewhere in the world. Um, and here's what we'll cover generally. So the collection, the collection online, um, exhibitions in London, our UK touring exhibitions, installations in non-traditional venues, um, events, really importantly, group visits, study room visits and library and archive visits. And of course, all of these aspects of our work um, rely on research by a huge number of curators, educators and content creators to make all of this accessible. Um, we rely on many, many different staff at the museum and, and our volunteers as well. So firstly, I just wanted to talk a tiny bit about a new resource that we have that will open in to the public around, uh, we hope, in 2024, and that is the British Museum Archaeological Research Collection. So as well as our study rooms in London, we will have this new study room, um, which is going to be in Wokingham. And this is the site where our archaeological collections um, will be. And they are moving from Blythe House to this new site, which is uh, part of um, University of Reading Science Park. And the Natural History Museum will also be our neighbours there. So it's just really exciting new study room um, that you can you will be able to book to visit in the future. And I just wanted to show you that as a really enticing thing that's coming soon. Um, we've just finished practical completion. So this is an artist impression, but the building is has now been handed over to us to fit out and um, it's designed by John McCasden Architects. So I just wanted to talk about that. It's also got a seminar room there as well. So we will be having some events there. So um, first of all, let's talk about the collection and what an amazing collection it is. It's free for everyone to visit and group visits can now be booked again. The group's entrance, I just wanted to talk about that. When you come to visit as a group, um, if you come to the north entrance on Montague uh, Place, you'll find that much easier to get into the museum, less queues, and also that's our group um, visits uh, entrance. The British Museum has around 8 million objects and around 4 million are available for research on our collections online. 
There are eight collections departments, Africa, Oceania and the Americas, Asia, Britain, Europe and prehistory, coins and medals, Egypt and Sudan, Greece and Rome, Middle East and prints and drawings. Prints and drawings collection alone has, for example, around 50,000 drawings and around 2 million prints from the 15th century to the present day. And here are just some of the fantastic um, works you can see in our study rooms. So from top left, uh, top right, sorry, uh, Michelangelo drawing of flying angels from 1534 to 6. And Utagawa Hiroshiga print uh, up to the left of that, a night view from um, 100 Famous Views of Edo, um, 1857. And that features figures and tea houses and shops and dogs and in this area of, of Edo, which was uh, where the theatres were. Uh, then we've got to the bottom right, we've got Mark Dion's Museum Culture. This is a, an acquisition that was bought in uh, 2020, so during the pandemic, from his series called Intangible Associations, Museum Culture. Um, so that, that one was acquired in the pandemic. And then on to the left of that, a digital C print um, by Sagda Tirafkan, a human tapestry, 2009, a photo collage of people's faces creating a Persian carpet. Um, and that was funded by our patrons group. Um, and they, these groups allow us to buy these contemporary um, artworks from around the world to build our collection. So it's, it's really incredible. And uh, the, this artist's work explores um, Iranian identity through these amazing photo collages. So um, I wanted to talk a bit about our website as well. Um, it was redeveloped and relaunched at the start of 2019, just in time for the, you know, when, when we close. So it's a really important resource for art history. And we've continued to add content and we've got a plan for what we will do next. So we're, we're building content on that. It's a fantastic resource. And our blog as well, that's another thing you can connect with. And on the collections online section, there's also a guide on how to use a collection online. And it's really simply laid out to help you to really make the most of collections online. Um, that is a way that you can see what's on display and what you'd like to come and see in the museum. So um, let's turn to some recent examples of exhibitions at the British Museum in London. And here are a couple of examples of where art has featured in recent shows. So um, this is our World of Stonehenge show, um, which closed fairly recently. And on the right there, I'm just showing you some of the William Blake prints that were shown at the end of that um, show to, to really demonstrate how artists um, and um, all sorts of people have been inspired by Stonehenge and the world of Stonehenge, so the wider period of time uh, of around when Stonehenge was created. And then on the left, um, Rose Ferraby, um, a contemporary artist archeologist, she was commissioned to create a sound commission for Sea Henge, which is a henge that was found um, in the sea in Norfolk. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And we managed, we were able to bring that from the Norfolk Museum Service to the British Museum and, and have part of it displayed there. And we worked with that artist, Rose Ferrari, to actually create a soundscape, but not only that, the work below is, is a work that she um, has created in relation to Sea Henge there as well. So some really interesting ways of how we work with artists and how art history is represented within our exhibitions. And here also a really fantastic thing was an event um, called Inspired by Stonehenge and its world. And you can catch up with all our events on our YouTube, uh, British Museum YouTube events channel. And this one might be of real interest to you to go back and watch again. I mean, the fantastic thing about these events is that you can go and see them again. And this one here, you'll see there on the screen, the, art, the Turner winning artist, Jeremy Della, um, featured in this event. And 
that's because he's made a number of works relating to Stonehenge, um, including Sacrilege, which is a life-sized bouncy castle version of Stonehenge. Um, many prints that he's produced as well. And he was really contributing to that talk. We also, as part of that talk, had experts talking about um, how it inspired the artists of British Romanticism. So J.M.W. Turner, John Constable, people like that, evoking the mystery in deeply distant time um, in, their, in their artwork. So a really fantastic way into art history through that exhibition. And another way, a great way that you can use the museum as a resource for learning about art history is attending our events programs um, or in person at the museum. And this was, these are some images of our solstice late event at the museum, which attracted a, a few thousand people. Um, and again, it was um, curated with Jeremy Della. So that was a really fantastic way of an artist um, creating something for us as well and taking part in that event and being there on the day as well so it's quite extraordinary um, event and uh, yeah so hope you'll join us for some of those if you are in the UK and I want to talk a bit also about Feminine Power our exhibition that is is on um, now it's it is closing shortly um, and it's from the the subtitle is the divine to the demonic and it featured uh, works by Judy Chicago, you can see here um, on the bottom, and Kiki Smith's sculpture Lilith, um, loaned from the Met, and seen here on the accompanying book to the exhibition um, that is available as well. And that book, you know, that's another resource for art history is some of our books like this one that, that will have some of that art history in them as well. And also a newly commissioned sculpture on the top right here um, by the Bengali artist Kaushi Ghosh. Um, and that was amazing, cre creating an artwork and, and an icon for that exhibition and for the collection. And that was accessioned into the collection as well. So really wonderful different ways that we're working with contemporary artists and yeah, from, from around the world as well. And here you can see some of the events um, that we've recorded and we'll be uploading more of those here um, so you can find out more about that particular exhibition and some of those uh, talks that do relate, will relate directly to our history. So I know Hilary's going to talk a bit more about um, study rooms later, but I'm just flashing up this image of the prints and drawings study room. Um, we have resumed welcoming groups back to our study rooms. So if you're a teacher or lecturer wishing to take students uh, to see artworks that are not on display, for example, in the prints and drawings study room, you'll need to book at least two weeks in advance. There's a maximum space for 10 people at the centre table in the study room where you can put out the artworks and larger groups would be then split into different time slots. So you bring your whole group and maybe split one group could go looking in the museum collection, one group could come here and then they could swap over. Um, you need to supply a list of what you want to look at. Um, in the collection and pr please provide as much information as you can. Um, so complete references, register, museum numbers, the artist's name, location, uh, references to standard catalogues, things like that. Um, but there's plenty of information on our website to help you to do that. And it's really well worth making a visit if you haven't already. And we'd really love you to come there's nothing better than looking at the artworks um, and seeing them in front of your, yourselves. There's lots more guidance on our website, as I said, and individual researchers, I'm sure many of you will be individual researchers and or, or just really want to see something close up. And you can also book individual visits. Uh, you might also be interested in our libraries and archives. And I'm just going to go on to the final of my slides, which has got some of those links to um, how you email to make an appointment, for instance, in Prints and Drawing Study Room. If you go to that link there, there are the emails for all of the different department study rooms because our collection of that relates to art history will be across all of those study rooms, no doubt. Um, but 
if you're interested in um, Western art history, for instance, then Prints and Drawing Study Room is probably the best place to start for that. Um, but again, the curators can give you help if you email them as well. They'll let you know which study room you'll be able to see things in as well. So that's all my slides. And I'm going to now pass on to and introduce my colleague, Maria Boyanowska. So Maria is head of national programs at the British Museum. Maria has worked at the museum for over 13 years. And over this time, her roles have all focused on working in partnership with museums and galleries across the UK. And she's built a really wide network of colleagues and collaborators. And before she joined the British Museum, she worked at Tate Britain and also at Contemporary Art Galleries, having studied art practice at both Wimbledon College of Art and the University of Leeds. So she has that real background in art as well. So really delighted to have you here, Maria, and I'll pass over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, and thank you so much for inviting me here today to speak. Um, it's been a lot of fun bringing this um, presentation together. So, the national programme. I thought it might be helpful to give you a little sense of the reach of the national programme across the UK. As you can see, we work with over 250 museums, and that includes art galleries as well within that mix. It's a huge range and a growing diversity of organisations that we're working with. We bring a number of objects around the UK any given year. And since pandemic um, times, uh, we pre-pandemic were reaching around 10 million people. Um, we are building that back up, so 3 million people um, last year, and we're hoping that that number will increase again this year. So it's, it's a really significant number, and outreach is the number that come to London to visit the British Museum. So we're really proud of that statistic. So I thought it might be fun to tell you a little bit more about the National Programme through a selection of art objects and related projects. I hope that this will give you an insight into how you can explore the collection across the UK. And to give me a bit of a structure, I thought I might try and do this chronologically. So we will start the National um, Programme Lens Objects um, to museums across the UK, sometimes as part of temporary exhibitions or on long-term loan. And the object pictured here and um, toured the country as part of a spotlight tour, which is profiling a single object and exploring its many historical perspectives. The swimming reindeer um, pictured here was discovered in the French Pyrenees and dates to around 13,000 years ago. This is the oldest art object um, in the British Museum, made from the tip of a mammoth tusk and um, towards the end of the last ice age. It shows a male reindeer following a female. The animals are carved as if they were swimming and their noses up out of the water and the representation as I as I am sure you'll agree is is highly realistic. What makes this one of the earliest pieces of art in the British Museum is a really interesting question. It was initially thought to be possibly a handle for a weapon or some sort of tool but research has proven that it's that this is a sculpture that is not created to be strong and hard wearing for any sort of practical use. Hence, this and other objects of this period represent a time of artistic creativity. And Sarah mentioned this within our collection, this sense of, you know, not just about being around survival, but the creation of the modern mind as we know it today and um, was developed and represented through these objects. Now, the major exhibition, Ice Age Art, which you may be familiar with, the arrival of the modern mind is, is still available, available to explore through the associated publication. Um, and it includes this object amongst others. But I would implore you to visit Cresswell Crags um, in the Midlands, where we have a number of long-term loans um, from this prehistoric period and that also um, cover similar themes. So next in our, in our tour. So moving slightly further in time to 11,000 years ago, the Ansakari lovers figurine. Discovered in Palestine, this intimate sculpture is the earliest known depiction of a couple making love. It is usually assumed to be a man and a woman, um, but should that be assumed so readily? Um, genders of the figures are ambiguous, and this object has therefore been explored through the lens of gender and sexuality at the British Museum. The object was a highlight and a centerpiece for an exhibition that toured around the UK as part of the national programmes called Desire Love Identity, Exploring LGBTQ Histories. The exhibition brought together a wider selection of objects and works of art 
and brought the topic right up to date with contemporary artworks by David Hockney, for example, and others. You can continue to explore this topic at the British Museum through the Desire Love Identity Trail, which is also available to view online for those that can't make it to the museum itself. So moving again um, to another part of the world and another step forward and to an object that many may have walked past possibly if they visited the museum. This stunning sculpture is displayed in the Mesopotamia galleries, right next to ancient Egypt. That's why I suspect you might have walked past it if you're heading into those busy, busy galleries. Um, and Mesopotamia is a region that covers modern day Iraq and Syria. Over 4,000 years ago, this sculpture was created by the Sumerian people who believed that their cities belonged to the gods. It was the job, therefore, of each city's king to build temples of the gods where they could leave offerings of food and drink. Judea, the king of Jersey, which is depicted here, had this sculpture of himself placed in one of the city's temples to show that he was always worshipping the gods. The statue shows Judea dressed as a priest in long robes and his head shaven. His hands are held together in an act of worship and his eyes are wide open in praise. It is made of a dark, hard stone called dolerite, which Judea had especially brought to him from the mountains of modern day Oman, over 1,000 miles away. This stunning sculpture, recently toured as part of an exhibition on ancient Iraq, and visited both Newcastle and Nottingham as part of that exhibition. It's a larger exhibition exploring one of our ancient civilizations is another strand of our activity in the National Programme. We explore a huge range of topics through these exhibitions. Our next touring exhibition will focus on ancient Egypt and we'll be announcing those partners which will be starting for next year. So one to look out for. So talking of ancient civilizations, um, a touring exhibition that has recently just closed explored the epic tale of the 10-year war between the Greeks and the Trojans and is one of the world's greatest stories told for over 3,000 years. The exhibition brought together a selection of stunning artworks from over 2,500 years ago and more recent interpretations of the story with works um, by Rossetti. I thought it might be of interest to show you um, and to introduce this exhibition, as we made a selection of the objects available um, to a wider audience through 3D scans. Hopefully this won't make you dizzy, <laughs> but this is just to give you a sense of a high resolution 3D image um, that we made available and is still available via Sketchfab. And it was an opportunity to, and I thought it may be of interest, to be able to explore the objects in the, in the exhibition and be able to manipulate the image, zooming right into the detail, being able to look at all the many sides, often sides of the object that you wouldn't be able to see in a showcase. Uh, as you can see, the scans capture the texture and the smallest detail um, and are really just a great opportunity to see some of our collection um, in, a, in a different way. And also for those that aren't able to get to the museum to see them on display, to be able to see them um, in different, different parts of the world. So please, um, I've just listed there where you can view these objects. If you Google or if you go onto Sketchfab and you search for the Troy Beauty and Heroism collection on Sketchfab, you'll be able to view these, these, stunning, these stunning works. So I thought you might also, as I mentioned, the Rossetti, um, it would be a shame not to show you. So here the pre-Raphaelite um, artist Rossetti's work featuring the Trojan encampment before going to war with the Greeks. And the print focuses on the Trojan princess Cassandra um, standing on the battlements of Troy as her brother Hector leaves for battle. And she foretells the destruction that Helen will bring um, but is fated never to be believed. Um, I thought important, and we, we've all mentioned, we all, all mentioned this, but of course how artists have forever used ancient tales and the British Museum's, um, well, objects represented by the British Museum as inspiration. So a really important point I thought worth making again. Um, and it continues, um, artists continue to be inspired. So as part of the Troy exhibition, 
um, artists continue to be inspired by the epic tale through um, live drawing sessions that, that took place as part of the public programming um, and engagement. And again, this is a really key part of our touring activity, but as well as the exhibitions, obviously touring from venue to venue um, and being part of the displays within those organisations, the programming is, a, is, a, is again something that we support to ensure that we engage a broader audience um, with the subjects um, across the country. So another important role of the national program is to be relevant to the locations and um, that our objects, where our objects are displayed. So here, the Lampedusa Cross, which is currently on tour across the UK as part of Crossings Community and Refuge Exhibition. The object, the object profiled um, here is at Coventry Cathedral. Um, and of course, the object itself is, is a symbol um, and representation of the refugee crisis. And of course, no better place to display this object than Coventry, a city of sanctuary. The object itself was one of many crafted by a carpenter on the island of Lampedusa, where um, from the wreckage of the migrant boat, which resulted um, in the loss of 300 lives at sea, is a humble object gifted to the arriving migrants. It was a message of solidarity, welcome and love. Placed here on the high altar um, at Coventry Cathedral, where it was presented for a weekend only. And this is something that we're trying to do more is to bring our objects to non-museum spaces, non-traditional spaces, um, so that we can reach a broader audience. Um, the object here powerfully reframes the artworks in the cathedral. In the backdrop, you'll see Christ in glory in the tetramorph, um, the large tap tapestry by Graham Sutherland um, installed in the north end of Coventry Cathedral. And behind, immediately behind the, the Lampedusa cross is the cross inspired by the Cross of Nails, which was created from the scorched remains of the destroyed cathedral. Um, the Geoffrey Clark's high altar cross is a powerful echo of the tragedy that is represented by also within the land producer cross itself. So this juxtaposition of, of British Museum objects to create connections and dialogue with artworks um, where, the, where our objects are presented, and these interventions that give new or renewed meaning to art displays and places, the National Programme creates local resonance um, and new ways of seeing the British Museum collection. Also in Coventry, um, we worked, we were lucky enough to work with the local community there to make connections through place um, with our prints and drawings collection. So here is a display of artwork selected by young people. You'll see, um, you'll maybe recognise the prints and drawings study room which, which Sarah introduced, um, which brought work um, to Coventry um, that made connections to that place. And this was a, a really interesting project for us to be involved with because we brought the works, as you'll see, to a city arcade. So works, for example, by Coventry-born artist George Shaw um, and iconic works by Kata Kolvitz, um, which I'll give you a small flavour of. So, of course, tragically connected to Coventry, Kata Kolvitz, um, through the destruction of her home city of Dresden during the Second World War. The display and in Coventry created a partnership with Historic England and was installed in the windows of shops in the Coventry City Arcade um, spaces, a mid-century shopping centre. The exhibition of the reproduced um, prints and drawings created an entirely new experience of the works, as you can see. The surrounds are very different to what you might expect. Here you can see the Katakovitz um, portrait of Hans and, and a study of, 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 um, of her portrait, sorry, <laughs> mumbled my words, in the window of, of I think, a, a mobile phone shop. I think that's this, this particular view. So you can see just that opportunity, a completely unique opportunity for us to connect with passers-by who might not have ordinarily um, had a relationship with these works. So thinking again about creating relevance for people in place, the National Programme also works with partners to create long-term galleries um, through our partnership gallery programme. These galleries display significant objects from the British Museum collection and can be found in Glasgow, Newcastle, York, Carlisle and Truro. Two further galleries will be opening over the coming years in Manchester and Norwich. The gallery in Manchester is our first to focus on South Asia. The gallery has been co-curated with a collective of community members 
The object, interpretation and design have all been developed directly with the collective, hand in hand. The stories of South Asia explore its history and contemporary meaning and include historic art like the miniature paintings presented here. But also we're, of course, exploring the contemporary through contemporary commissions um, and also um, more contemporary works which are being borrowed for the display. One such commission um, is currently being created by the Singh twins to be displayed in the entrance of the space to the new gallery, which we're all very excited about soon. The gallery is due to open in February next year, so please do visit um, if you have the chance. Here is an example. This isn't, of course, the commission that's yet to be unveiled, but an example of the Sing Twins work, which brilliantly utilises the traditions of South Asian imagery, which I present as part of the, of the miniatures, but while simultaneously, um, and I think fascinatingly, also tackling contemporary themes. So my last slide. So finally, bringing this journey, this tour, <laughs> one might say, of the national programmes in the context of art history and coming right up to date. Um, a work created in 2021, so only last year. This stunning piece by Charmaine Watkiss has only just been acquired by the museum and formed part of a recently closed exhibition, Drawing Attention, displaying the work of emerging artists who have worked in or possibly worked and, and lived in the UK. This exhibition presents artworks by some of the youngest artists the British Museum has ever acquired. And um, it comments on the medium of drawing now, but also reflects on how it has evolved with the display also including works from museum's historic drawing collection. The exhibition will next year tour the UK um, we are just finalising those partners, so please do watch this space to see where this visits. And we're really excited about creating again those opportunities for venues and communities to reflect on these works and how they resonate with their place and with their location and also the collections and the spaces that we visit. And again, inevitably creating new interpretations and new meanings. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you listening today. Handing back to Sarah. Thanks so much, Maria. And I think everyone will agree that that was an amazing range of, of, of artworks and uh, a lot of food for thought there. And thanks for doing that roundup of, of where, we, where we're going and where we've been around the country as well. It's really exciting. Thanks, Maria. Um, now I'm really delighted to welcome Hilary Williams. Hilary Williams is Education Officer Art History, working on adult learning programmes in the Learning and National Partnerships Department at the British Museum. And Hilary was previously a curator in the museum's Department of Prints and Drawing, so she has that fantastic background and knowledge of the collection. Um, she's published on Rembrandt and in the Times Educational Supplement. She's an art historian who studied at UEA, and the Courtauld Institute of Art, London University. Hilary has also worked for the Royal Collection Trust and the Wallace Collection, and she's lectured widely in the UK, USA, and Europe. Welcome, Hilary, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, and Maria, that was so very interesting. And what I'd like to do is to pick up some of the themes about the interconnectedness of the collections and also how there are numerous approaches to looking at the collections in an art historical way. Some very traditional from really the beginnings of art history to the contemporary world. And um, for our listeners, both Sarah and Maria have shown a great deal about how we're moving the collection on, how it is a contemporary collection, just as much as an historical one. So I'd like to begin by really taking us back to the, the beginning of art history and the beginning of the British Museum's collections. And that really means right back to 1753, when objects like this beautiful drawing by Dürer, Albrecht Dürer, came into the collection with the founding bequest or, or gift of uh, Sir Hans Sloan, this amazing physician, his court physician. Uh, he, he was uh, not so much a patron of the arts as very much a man who was interested in curiosities of the natural world. And that's really why this object came into the collection, not as a drawing, 
not as a work by an old master, but as an object which showed a curiosity of nature. It showed a creature of the natural world. In this case, as Albrecht Dürer would have known it, a, um, an elk. And so this is a sort of moose from the European environment rather than the North American environment. And Dürer puts underneath it, you can just see by the second hoof from the left, an inscription that says lie heart. So this is really what we would call an elk. It's the most exquisite watercolour, beautifully observed, very carefully observed in watercolour and body colour. And this is obviously the sort of creature which we know was to be found around where Dürer came from, from Nuremberg. So this is a really gorgeous object and it it's part of a story, it's part of the way in which we can tell the narrative of how objects come to be, how images come to be the way they are. And so it's a bit of a surprise, I'd have to say, when you then look at this utterly exquisite engraving, copper plate engraving made by Dürer, who was the graphic genius par excellence of the uh, early 16th century. And although, he, of course, he's producing before that, but this is of the opening years of the um, 16th century. And one would have to bear in mind that there is the great burgeoning of the Italian Renaissance, not that far from where Dürer was on the south of the Alps. And of course, Dürer comes south uh, come, literally comes over the Alps and into Italy, comes to Venice. He meets all sorts of interesting, inspiring artists who, because Dürer then comes north of the Alps, uh, they inspire northern painting in what we eventually know as the German Renaissance. So with this in engraving, you might be looking, and I've deliberately um, allowed time for your eye to meander around this, because here are Adam and Eve, and behind the tree of knowledge in the middle, in between them, there is an image of what looks suspiciously like a moose or an elk. And so the watercolour you've just seen by Dürer was saved by Dürer and then put together with other drawings he'd made of other animals and people. And hey presto, they end up as this most exquisite representation of Adam and Eve. And uh, the British Museum is very lucky in having several drawings which relate to this composition, but uh, at least two of them are dependent upon coming into the collection courtesy of Sir Hans Sloan, who was basically collecting those drawings as um, sort of mementos of the natural world, of studies of the natural world. Now, the, the absolutely stunning way in which Dürer was representing the human form, particularly the male form, can be seen in this drawing by Michelangelo. And we have to bear in mind that Dürer, north of the Alps, based in Nuremberg, is contemporary with Michelangelo at the beginning of his powers. And the museum is fantastic, actually outstanding for showing the interconnectedness of images as we've already seen hinted. So with this one, we're going to see just a run of images which show how the museum can actually represent how artists are thinking aloud on paper or in sculpture, how they then develop those ideas and then make products from that. And very often we can show what those end products are. And this is just one of thousands of examples one could choose. This is a drawing in the prints and drawings department, which has 82 works by Michelangelo. I mean, is, isn't this the greatest of thrills that you can go into the print room, request Michelangelo drawings, actually handle Michelangelo drawings or other such works by great masters of world renown. So amongst those drawings is this one. And it is so interesting because this might be known as an academic study. There's Michelangelo with other artists sitting around a nude male model, adopting an utterly excruciating pose 
I mean, if you can imagine holding this pose as would have been as would have been usual for um, say an hour, this then in pen, ink, and highlighting worked with for the most part a quill ends up as an incredibly complicated composition like this, which shows a very famous battle, the Battle of Cascina, which was between the Florentines and the Pisans, and it's close to the river Arno. And very often, if you, for example, go to Pisa Airport today and you, you're then heading off for your holiday in, in Tuscany or whatever, you will often see signs to Cascina or Cascina. So this is an engraving of a massive mural which Michelangelo was commissioned to make in the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence itself. And this is one of the, the sort of pivotal points in Renaissance art history because what it shows loud and clear is that there was an overriding preoccupation in representing the human form the male human form in all of its different contortions, twists, forms, and so on. And you might notice just the, the third lower figure from the left, that that is the same figure whom we've just seen in a preparatory drawing for this complicated composition. This is a print by uh, San Galo who made, and there are many others who are making such prints, including Veneziano, and they are making images after the Michelangelo. These are terribly important because the composition no longer exists. So when you think that Michelangelo and Leonardo were actually competing talents within this Palazzo Vecchio commission, the, this composition had to be something that was really great and show-stopping. Now, just in the river at the bottom in the middle, you'll see two hands just sort of grabbing at the air. And this might be said to be a drowning man. So it's a surprise when you then go around our European galleries and you come across this utterly beautiful plate made in Maiolica. It was commissioned by Cardinal Bembo, who of course has his um, uh, portrait painted by Titian. And Bembo was the librarian of the Library of St. Mark's in Venice and was utterly instrumental in creating the new structure designed by San Savino there uh, to house a, a phenomenal library. So Bembo is a, a, an amazing man. He has fingers in many pies and operates in all sorts of different places, including Rome, Venice and Florence. So with this plate, you can see on the left-hand side, there is a really contorted figure going through contraposto. The top part of his body is going in a different plane from that of his lower half. But that figure is based on a print, the print which I've just shown you, or a variation, a smaller version of that print. And it relates to the preparatory drawing, which we have in the Department of Prints and Drawings in the British Museum. Down below in the bottom, you will see in the middle that, surprise, surprise, our drowning man has suddenly developed into a potholer, it seems. He's coming up from the depths, from the darkness. So I use this really to show the interconnectedness of, of objects within our collections, even though in their own time, they might not have had an immediate physical uh, connection, but stylistically, you know, if art history is uh, a matter of telling narratives about how images develop, how they uh, are interconnected across cultures and how they are spread, this object really tells that whole story. So, Obviously, the Maiolica painter really couldn't be bothered with producing 100 figures or whatever and just concentrates on these four main figures and this poor man's arms emerging from the depths. Now, where the British Museum really scores is that it can tell you how art history was developed as a discipline, how it came about, how it comes out of that period of great curiosity. And what might seem a very ordinary case like this one, in the Enlightenment Gallery, which is room one in the British Museum, 
you have these very carefully, cunningly orchestrated objects. And if you read them uh, from left to right, as would be usual, uh, you have this beautiful selection of a Greek figure on the left-hand side, a much later Greek figure, second from the left. Then why are these different? Well, you might just notice their legs. On the left-hand side, the legs are fused together in the method of casting this bronze object. The second object from the left shows how drapery has been put between the legs, but from a casting point of view of a bronze, this makes it easier. You can then see how that method is refined with the third figure from the left, where there is space between the legs, and this required unbelievably sophisticated bronze casting. And then on the extreme right, you have a figure who is rather attenuated and moving. And so this is the way in which it was thought, well, this seems to be crucial for art history, <laughs> crucial for art history. This seems to be a way of showing a stylistic development of objects from one period to another. And so you start with sort of early Greek, uh, just after Cycladic on the left-hand side, you develop through until on the right-hand side, you have a Roman bronze, which looks back to Greece, but develops it so that there is this, dare I say, mannerism of form. Now elsewhere in the Enlightenment Gallery, which is an utterly brilliant gallery in the way it's set up and uh, in which it presents beautifully curated objects which tell all sorts of complicated narratives in a beautifully straightforward way so that we can see basically why much of the structure of how we think today was developed within the Enlightenment period, this long century, and it's mostly 18th century into the early 19th century. So when you look at what might seem a really rather prosaic book, this is Bernard de Montfaucon's work known as Antiquity Explained in the 1720s. You might notice on the right-hand page that there seem to be all these similar types of objects. Each one's different, but they are similar of a type. So generically, they're the same. And they're like a hand used as a, a generic object, as a votive object. So you would go to the doctor and you would say, my hand hurts here, what can it be? And he would make a wax version of it in antiquity. And then you take it to the temple and hopefully the gods would intercede and get rid of the devils from your hand and you would feel better. So this is just so interesting in the sense that you have all of these objects of one type and rather remarkably, you know the dates of say three of them. And so this is one of the primary sources in art history for establishing how art history then says, well, if I know the date of that one, that one, and that one, and they're different dates, how can I then tell stylistically how these have developed and what the date of others might be for which I don't have a date on them or there's no inscription of an emperor or whatever. So the thought of this is beautifully shown within this exquisite Enlightenment gallery. And in the Enlightenment gallery is a case that says the birth of art history. And this is ultra significant because in it is really the father of art history in this context. And that is um, JJ Winkelmann. And here he is, he was a remarkable thinker. He um, was finely attuned to the delights of the classical world and this somewhat later, this 1845 watercolour by Stefanov, shows you the, the extraordinary range of different cultures, the sculpture of different cultures represented within the British Museum. And you can see Mexican, Honduran, Duran, Phidias at the top from the greatness of the Greek world, Hindu, Roman, Asians, and um, Asian and many other cultures all brought together, including ancient Egyptian. So this was like a sort of comparative method of coming at art history and Winkelmann um, coming out in favor 
of Greek culture, although, of course, our perceptions are now changing. Now, Winkelmann had a best buddy, and he was called Sir William Hamilton, who just happened to be our great diplomat in and around the Bay of Naples. And Hamilton was truly enlightenment brain. He was curious about everything and anything, particularly any objects being brought out of this volcanic soil such as it was around the Bay of Naples and as a result of this he started questioning well are all of these objects of the same time they're obviously not they seem to be significantly different and the major publication uh, from Hamilton was this which came out in 1766 he hired a spoof baron called uh, the Baron Doncavy who was not a baron at all to produce this work. And it has one of the least snappy titles in history. It's called The Antiquité Etrusque Grec et Roman Tiré du Cabinet de Monsieur Hamilton. So this is really a way of setting out, well, what are these objects? Are they Greek, Roman, or this other thing, this other culture which seems related, but yet we don't quite understand. And that was then Etruscan. So fortunately, courtesy of Hamilton, we now know much more about this. And here is Hamilton on the left, displaying very obviously for us to see in this portrait of him by the great Sir Joshua Reynolds, a page of this vast uh, series of volumes. Now he happens to present the, the objects which he collected, which you can see here, uh, which he had excavated or caused to be excavated from around the Bay of Naples. And on this one, here we see uh, a red figure vase, which you can now see in the Enlightenment Gallery, and it shows the apotheosis of the poet. So there in the middle is the poet ascending from one stage of poetry to the next, holding the Aeolian harp, while others are listening on or are inspiring him. Now, the great thrill of all of this is that Hamilton was a trustee and he happened to present a version, an edition of a counter, um, counterproof version of uh, that book, the AEGR, as it's become known, to a friend of his who was called Josiah Wedgwood. And this is the most wonderful way in which you can tell the narrative of how neoclassical objects are directly inspired tangibly by classical evidence, real accurate uh, evidence. And with this, this is the most stupendous piece of Jasper Ware designed by the original Josiah Wedgwood, Josiah Wedgwood I. And he produced it in about 1786. And there in the middle of it, in this almost intaglio technique, this relief technique, is a variation on a theme of what we've just seen in the Hamilton book, the publication. And you can look at that publication in the students' room of the Greek and Roman department. So you can request to see it, and then you can see these related objects in galleries uh, on public display. Now, this is in the European galleries, room 47. And it relates to the object in room one. So you can see both or all those three things in one day. Now, this was not any old object. This was Wedgwood combining his interest in art, in what he thought of as being modern contemporary art, with the best he could produce in the scientific method of the day, the not necessarily mass production, but he was trying to get the best production for as many people, as broad a spectrum of society as he could. So this Pegasus vase, so-called because it has, unlike the Hamilton original, the, the Greek original on which it's based, uh, it has, I hope you can see it on the top, on the lid, the rearing horse of Pegasus with his wings outstretched as he's about to launch off from Mount Parnassus. So this, this is Wedgwood improving almost, or trying to improve on the classical world, making this an object very much for his own age. But I think what's interesting to bear in mind is Wedgwood actually presented this to the British Museum. Largely one can't help but feel through his friend, the trustee Hamilton, on the basis that Wedgwood wanted this to be 
an image of, an example of, what a great piece of contemporary art this was. This was the best he could produce, and he wanted to be in a museum setting so that future generations could see what a great accomplishment of his own age this was. And when you look at it closely, it shows the a really exquisite moulding by John Flaxman, who designed this. Of course, he was at the forefront of English neoclassicism during this period. So I think this does really beg the question, when does contemporary art become art history? And you've seen a lot, of, uh, courtesy of my, my dear colleagues, Sarah and Maria, on how much contemporary art is now being collected by the British Museum right the way across the board. And perhaps one should also say uh, that in, in addition to these wonderful um, Pandora boxes, really what one might call them, the students' rooms across the museum, the student rooms which uh, relate to each of the curatorial departments, which uh, Sarah enumerated. You, you've seen already prints and drawings, uh, and I've mentioned the Greek and Roman one, but sharing the student room of um, prints and drawings is the Asia department student room. And it's there that you would go to see one of the most I mean, fun and inspiring pieces of contemporary art, uh, which you're likely to, to come across. This is uh, known as Alcite and her sunglasses by the, Middle East, by the Egyptian uh, uh, artist Huda Lutfi. So I mention this very specifically because some of you probably came to the museum and saw the, a really awe-inspiring exhibition, very stimulating show. And this is absolutely sort of current. It shows that the uh, tradition of art history in the British Museum is not only within the Western tradition, although it is phenomenally strong in that respect, but because of the way in which fairly contemporary or modern and contemporary art has been collected, this is an ongoing collection. So if you or I were to visit in 50 years, 100 years, we would be looking back at objects like this to show uh, their role in the development of the history of art. This is uh, one that I should add, which was acquired through this group within the British Museum, which is known as CAMIA. And this is the group for contemporary and model, modern Middle Eastern art. So if you are interested in seeing how objects like this look back into the collections, look back into previous traditions, but also show the way forward, then you have plenty of scope to explore these student rooms and the collections at the British Museum. So on that provocative thought, might I hand back to Sarah? Thank you so much, Hilary, and thank you to you, Maria, as well, um, and to the Association of, of Art History for making us, um, giving us this opportunity to be part of the programme, the festival programme. I hope you've all been inspired today to use the British Museum's um, collection as a resource for art history, and whether you come and visit or see artworks around the country as part of our tours. Um, we look forward to really look forward to meeting you soon. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>